Thank you ever so much for joining us for our first live web chat with Bears stars of the past. And our very uh, honoured first guest is Alan Donald. And uh, welcome to you, Alan. Welcome to everyone, wherever you're listening, whether you're in the UK or abroad. And Alan, thank you very much for joining us. How's it looking over there in South Africa? Thanks, Brian. Uh, and uh, welcome to all our... Uh, uh, fans and uh, of course uh, members that are joining the chat um, yeah look it's um, I just think that not in a million years I would have, would have thought that we're we'll sitting in this position uh, of, of imprisonment um, where uh, it is it's it's really tough on everyone at the moment um, we, we're doing our best as we possibly can to to get on with life and um, um, I've been lucky enough actually to, to, to do my planning for the new season for, 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 for the night. So I start this job officially today, um, but that will have to be on the back burner, I reckon, for the next couple of months um, as we build towards September. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that um, um, everything will be all right uh, come September. Well, hopefully cricket uh, all around the world can resume uh, as soon as possible. In the meantime, we've got this wonderful game to talk about. <laughs> and uh, plenty to talk about with you, AD. We've got loads of questions. Thanks to all the members that have sent questions. In. So we've got some wonderful questions to throw at you. First of all, congratulations though, AD. You have been voted by the Warwickshire members as the greatest overseas bet, pipping the likes of Brian Lara and Rowan Canoy. That, that's a nice accolade. Yeah, I, I think, as I said to you, Brian, I, 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 I was just, fine with being nominated as one of the five. Um, that would have done for me nicely. Um, you know, to have been part of a, a Bears, um, um, or part of the Bears history uh, um, since 1987 um, has been a magnificent ride. And, and, um, and to, be, um, to have been voted by the members as uh, the best ever, you know, that, that is just something that I will never forget. So um, we've had some unbelievable success uh, I was part of uh, some some really really fine teams and and, and fine cricketers uh, during the mid 90s, and in our in our journey towards um, five trophies in two years, you know. Um, so it was a uh, yeah a ph phenomenal time to be part of uh, for sure. Well, we'll be talking about those two years plenty in the next hour, AD. We've got some wonderful questions from the members. Thanks to everybody that um, sent in questions. I did go through them last night and thought I might organise them into various ways, but they're such a diverse list, I thought I'm just going to crack on as they come. So, AD, um, let's get underway. The first question uh, is from Carl Jordan. Thanks ever so much, Carl. And it is quite a simple one. How important to you, AD, was the work of Keith Piper behind the stumps? Well, I've always said that I thought he was the best wicketkeeper in the UK. Um, um, I met Keith, he came on trial. I, I played a second 11 game in 1989 um, and, um, at uh, New Road at Leicester. And uh, no, it wasn't New Road, was it? Well, I'll just, uh, it, it's just at Leicester. Uh, and um, so, and he took a catch off me, it was off Tim Boone, um, diving high to his right. And took this amazing catch, and um, I, I just thought, you know, we got off the field, and 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 bless him, Neil Abbey asked me, he said, "What do you think of the young glove man?" And I said, "This guy's unbelievably good. Uh, you know, he, he, his ability to stand up to the stumps against the likes of Paul Smith, uh, never mind Tim Munton. Um, you know, at times even Gladstone Small to keep uh, to keep batters quiet in the crease. Um, it was." It was just phenomenal. He's, he's the best club man. I've, and and I, I take a great, um, uh, uh, um, I have great sympathy for wiki keepers, um, but I also enjoy their skills and what they bring. And I think Keith Piper for me was, was without a shadow of a doubt, was the, uh, we, we were lucky to have him. We were very, very lucky to have him. Let's put it that way. It must be very nice for a bowler um, to know that if you get a nick, even if it's way to his right or his left or over his head, it's very likely to be caught. Well, it was just, um, I think that the English way, and, and it started with Alan Knott back in those days, um, the way they glove the ball. Um, and English keepers are very different because the ball wobbles so much. And um, 
He had a, it, 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 it seemed that the ball just melted away in those gloves. Um, and he was very calm. He was so calm behind the stumps. He was a great mover, anticipated really, really well. Also broke a few digits on the way <laughs> with a wobbling ball. But, uh, but wow, if you needed a guy to stand up against, you know, and, and I, I, he took a leg start, a leg, a leg start stump, stumping in a crucial Benson Edges game, or a Natwes game, I think, against Kent. It was a quarterfinal game at Edgebaston, and he, and he caught, um, he stumped, he stumped uh, Aravinda de Silva down the leg side um, off Paul Smith. And it was just an absolute sublime, and I, only, and I think it's just great uh, a, a testament to his skill and, and, and how he watches the ball uh, and gloves it. And never mind the ability to stump someone off that pace of maybe a high 130s, you know. So, we, once again, I think we were just spoiled having Keith around us. Indeed. Now, we'll move on quickly because we've got so many questions to fit in. The next one comes from John Westwood. I think I know the answer to this, AD, from a chat we had recently. Was there a county side that you always felt confident playing against and that you always seemed to do well against? <laughs> yeah, for, for whatever reason, Yorkshire was my team. Um, um, I don't know why i i just i don't know uh it's a <laughs> it just happened for me against yorkshire whether it was at headingley or at edgebaston um i had tremendous success against uh, uh against yorkshire um and um and, and i just every time i played against them you almost feel like that you have that that sense of respect from 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 them um but also that gave me more sort of confidence in going to do what I needed to do. And uh, yes, so Yorkshire was that team for me um, uh, during that time. And just flowing on from that, uh, actually, AD, there's a question from Brian Perkins. Thanks for that, Brian. And he says, one of my special memories of you was of you bowling down the hill at Headingley to Richie Richardson in a Nat West game against Yorkshire. That must have been quite a, a confrontation. Um, and he says, which Nat West games stick in your memory? Um, I would say the semi-final, um, well, there's, there's, it, there were two actually. It was, yeah, semi-final against Worcester um, in 89. And that's the one that we won. Um, I, I, I still remember that roar of getting um, uh, Curtis out first ball. Um, and uh, if that game was sort of labelled um, as the Donald versus Hick game. And, um, and Graham Hick was playing unbelievably well um, during that time. And um, I ran in first ball and uh, struck him on the pad. Now, if DRS was uh, involved uh, during that time, I think that might have been not out. It just hit him outside the line. And the ball did enough, I think, to come back. But it, uh, um, just that roar when the umpire put up his finger was unbelievable. And I think the next the next game for me was the the uh, uh, the semi final game um, against um, Sussex. Also, it was a home semi uh, at, at Edgbaston. Um, I think I got five wickets in that game. Um, unfortunately, we we couldn't pull off uh, the, the the win. I think it was against Gloucestershire. Um, might be wrong, actually. Um, we, I think we might have gone on to win uh, against uh, North Ants um, yeah. at Lords after that. So, um, but yeah, those two for me really stands out as, as, as key games. Thank you, Odie. David Phillips asks, what are your greatest memories from your times with Warwickshire? Now, that's quite a, quite a big question, isn't it? And uh, if it's OK, David, I'll, I'll just move on from that because that is going to be involved in so many of our other questions. Um, Richard Du Rose asks one question that several people have asked about a gentleman called Michael Affelt Atherton, and he says, "Was the spell you bowled at Athers the best spell of your career?" Um, I would say it's probably the most aggressive spell that I've bowled in my career. Um, I think also the most control I've had, um, and and one of the big lessons that I've learned along the way is to when you lose your temper is to stay in the moment. And um, it, 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 it took a lot of breathing exercises during that spell <laughs> to keep my emotions intact. Um, but um, without a shadow of a doubt, the best 45 minutes I've had on a cricket field, one-on-one, -on -one, um, you almost don't even 
you almost don't even think that NASA has saying was sitting on his bat handle at the other end um, and watching it all unfold. And then, of course, the drop catch uh, off him off him as well, which made it even worse. But uh, in terms of intensity, in terms of just pure um, blow for blow, uh, it was definitely the best uh, the best time I spent on the field uh, for sure. And just related to that, actually, AD Gary Fox. Um asks, um, did, did you get on with Michael Atherton as a guy? Because everyone knows the battles you had on the pitch were very fierce. Um, all good off the field? He's a very good friend of mine, Michael Atherton. Um, you know, it all started straight after that incident, um, after the day's play. He, uh, he came to our dressing room, knocked on the door. He um, walked in and then said, can I have a... a AD come and sit on the step with me or have a beer and he gave me his um, right glove uh, with a massive red mark on it and uh, he said you can have this <laughs> um, you can have this for your benefit year so uh, um, and, and, and just as I'm laughing now I'm laughing I was laughing then because um, that was the true spirit that two guys gave each other absolutely nothing and um, to, to be able to come and share a beer afterwards was, was priceless, you know. Um, so, yeah, w I get on with him, still in contact with him. I'm still, still making fun of a few moments that we've had together. That's lovely, isn't it? And that's lovely about cricket, isn't it? That adversaries can, can get together after that way and, and mix so well. Uh, David Harding next um, asks AD, this is an interesting question, actually. How Because there were times when you were playing pretty much 12 months a year, wasn't there? And for a fast bowler, that's tough. And David asks, how did your training throughout a year go? And how did you uh, tailor it to make sure that you you could perform for all that time? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I was, I was, you know, after my first three years, I was at 87, 88, 89, when I returned back to, to Free State and start a new summer over there, I was cooked. And um, I had to find a way of, of balancing that fitness. And, and that was only one way was to, to be fitter. Um, so I had to be fit, very fit at the start of the season and even fitter at the end of it. Um, so I, I went and saw a guy at uh, uh, Free State University, uh, um, uh, uh, S&C guy there, um, who gave me some really, really good advice um, and also dietary um, um, you know, it wasn't your uh, normal three pints a day or uh, and a and a curry afterwards. Uh, it was looking after yourself properly. Um, so it was managing my fitness at the start of the season and then slow it down and then basically ramp it up uh, at the at the at the back end and start again. So I'm I must say that that really really helped. And I'm not going to bore you with all the detail in that fitness program, but it really helped me. To, to get through, especially in English, English season. I, I think um, a lot of people in the UK might, might realise this, but I keep saying to, to, to people who want to go and play county cricket, it's the toughest first-class gig in the world um, um, because there, there's so much cricket, um, there's so many teams, there's so much travelling, um, and looking after yourself is absolutely vital. So... And we played only three-day games back in those days. I think 24 three-day games. Um, and, and, and it was just on and on. And I was absolutely cooked when I came back. Um, but that helped me. That really, really helped me to find a great balance between, between being very fit at the start and then, and then ramp it up at the back end. And I was, I was good to go um, when I came back to South Africa. And of course, not least, it helped you in 95, that wonderful season when you took 88 championship wickets at 15 apiece. And uh, I did notice, looking through the Wisdoms the other day, that that season, when you had bowled your heart out for months, even in the last but one game against Derbyshire on the third evening, you blasted three out to turn the match on the third evening, the right end of a long season. So obviously that programme worked because you still had plenty of energy right at that end of the season. Well, um, that as well, and a lot of adrenaline, a lot of emotion, really, in, in that season as well, because that was, that was going to be uh, my last season for the Bears. Um, and because um, um, Brian Lara was coming back and he was going to be the new overseas player. And I think um, to come back to that fitness thing, yes, um, you know, I think that where you get really judged on 
um, yes, we were, we were very good in terms of our team performances and we were winning games of cricket consistently. Um, but also you needed to be so much fitter. You needed to be so much fitter. And I was, um, I was yeah, I've never felt better. I must admit, I never felt better. And I, I remember that game very, very well that late evening, um, uh, blowing three up. And then, you know, the game finished rather quickly the next day before lunch. So it's, uh, um, yeah, good memories. Yeah, and um, in the next game, of course, you clinched the title down at Canterbury. But I'm sure we'll come back to that season very soon. But meanwhile, Stuart Scott uh, mentions another game that you were involved in that you might not have entirely positive memories about, a certain World Cup semi-final. Um, <laughs> and he says hey, it was a great game for the neutral. But from your perspective, uh, any particular thoughts on it now? Um, the only one thought I have is that it will never, ever go away in people's memories. And uh, I was so excited to, to uh, you know, yes, we got in the semi-final. It is Australia. And even more so, it's at, at my home ground. Um, and um, I, I, I got, you know, me and Bob Warmer stood on the pitch the day before and I thought, oh, I've never seen a pitch a little bit so dry. Um, and, and I was worried about, you know, the worn factor. We were very worried about that. Uh, and, and it certainly did come in the game, 100%. But, but look, as the game turned out, um, um, you know, nightmarishly, so um, it, was a, it was a bitter one to, to swallow still to this day, so many years ago, that that, uh, that YouTube video will never be abandoned, <laughs> for sure. So, uh, um, but yeah, it was, a, it was a sickening blow, and especially at Edgbaston, uh, where it all started for me. Uh, very different subject here. Anthony Jones asks a very important question. Aston Villa or Birmingham City? Oh, wow. Now I'm going to upset a few people. Well, half half um, the audience can leave if you say the wrong thing. I think. OK, well, I, I, I am not a, a massive soccer fan. Uh, or shall I say football fan? Soccer is a swear word in England. Um, so... I'm going to go um, Birmingham City, um, only because a very good friend of mine um, who coached Birmingham City, um, who is a very big, um, you're going to need to help me out here, Brian. I've now forgotten his name. I'm sort of a bit startled at the moment. Um, he's a big Warwickshire fan and often sat in the, in the president's box. Um, and he got us to go to Birmingham City and I, we were allowed in their change room once or twice shared a few things in the how he coaches. Um, oh, I'm going to kick myself here for not remembering his name. It'll get to me at some point. Um, but, uh, yeah, look, we've had... Um, we've, we've <laughs> well, yeah, uh, wrong answer. Uh, <laughs> There's no right and wrong answer here, AD. I, <laughs> just like the city, the cricket club has got plenty of blues and villa, isn't it? Isn't it? So that was a bit of a googly that um, we threw at you yeah. there. Let's get back to cricket. Another good question from Carl Jordan here. Um, what do you think of the English contingent of Warwickshire players from the mid 90s? And he mentions particularly the likes of uh, Andy Moles and Keith Parker and uh, Piper and Paul Smith, who didn't play Test cricket, and Tim Munton played only two. Do you think maybe they could have, between them, Dominic Ostley could mention as well, I think, maybe they were a little bit hard done by, by the selectors? Well, I think Andy Moles was going to be selected to go on the um, tour of the West Indies. Uh, was it in 91 when he scored so many runs for Warwickshire? 91 and 92, and then he did his Achilles tendon. Um, he snapped his Achilles tendon and um, he, he sort of never really recovered from that injury um you know but that was the best he batted for you know I, I, it was it was also that year uh when they changed the ball slightly they went from the the dukes to the readers and it was just a run fest i think tom moody also scored a bag of runs um and i, I was convinced and, and andy was convinced that he would be uh, there was a lot talked about in the press about Moller's uh, involvement in the test team and, and uh, could be a, a candidate to go um, on tour. Um, Paul Smith, the same. Paul Smith, I, I, there was also that season where he had an, I can't remember which one it was now, Brian, but um, he had an absolute blinder of a, of a, of a, of a season and, and didn't get selected. 
um, on the winter tour. Um, and Tim Munton only played, is that right? One test? Two tests. Not one, two tests. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a shame. I mean, Dominic Osler, again, I think he, he played for the Lions, uh, Young Lions, uh, maybe on what, one, one occasion or a couple of occasions. Um, yeah, I think it's, those are pro proper cricketers who, who, who didn't really, um, whether it was overlooked, um, whether, you know, you can't tell me that they didn't fulfill their potential because they did. They really did. They were fine cricketers in their own right. So it's, it's a shame for them looking back at it now and, that, and you think, well, how can these guys not have played for England for, for a considerable amount of time? Well, it certainly worked in the Bears' favour during the mid-90s, didn't it? But they probably did deserve a bit of uh, recognition in, at national level, didn't they? But uh, just now moving on much more recently, AD, uh, the other year, Peter Hyatt uh, asks, how did you feel when you uh, received a spontaneous round of applause walking around the boundary during the Kent game in 2018? <laughs> I remember you thinking, blimey, it's a bit, bit like being royalty. There's... Uh... <laughs> I was really, really taken aback by that. I, I went and gave one of our guys a drink and I thought, well, I'll continue around. And, and then uh, these, it was quite a few. It was a beautiful day. I think, um, um, I think it might have been the last game of the season, wasn't it? Um, yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah. I, was, uh, I was really, really taken aback by that sort of um, reception. It was, it was absolutely awesome. Um, you know, and um, then you... You sort of felt, well, you know, this meant this meant a lot to these people what you've done at the, at this ground, and I appreciate that gesture until until this day. Another one, uh, a good question here, AD from Roger Small. He says, uh, amongst all of the batsmen that uh, you have dismissed around the world, is there one that gave you the most satisfaction to dismiss, and why? Um, Tendulkar. Um, there was actually two. There were two two guys. I would say Tendulkar and Brian Lara um, was uh, th they were the, my most highest valued um, targets, if you can call it that name, because they just were they just made the juices flow. Because Tendulkar was technically the best I've ever played against. Um, he could adjust his technique on any surface. He was the best player outside of India uh, on on surfaces in Australia. New Zealand and South Africa, uh, and, and of course England, he could adjust his technique. He was simply sublime. And, and then Lara for me, he, he was just a genius um, because he would, on his day, and I ran into him twice in 98 series in South Africa where he made 200s, was almost unstoppable, you know. Um, and he, he just... You know, when you think you've just bowled a decent delivery, uh, just back of a length, and, he's, and he hits it for four, and then you start to think, well, where's that come from? You know, it's, that is a... And you just say, well, whatever I'm doing next, I'm going back in there, and he just works it off his hip for one. So he made batting look stupidly easy. Um, but those two, for me, are the two finest players I've ever played against. Thank you, uh... AD. Now, Alan Plum uh, has a good question here. What do you consider was your best one-day bowling performance for Warwickshire? And one that uh, Alan throws into the mix was your 5 for 10 against Essex at Chelmsford uh, in 97. Um, all were bowled LBW or caught behind, he said. And as a spectator, it seemed you were unplayable that day. I think you had one or two good days at Chelmsford, uh, AD. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say uh, Essex uh, would come to mind, springs to mind. Um, wasn't sure about the figures now that you filled me in on that. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, that one, um, I think the Pfeiffer against uh, uh, Sussex, Edgebaston, um, there was, uh, there was a, it was a, uh, which game was that now? That was a NatWest game, I think it was. But, but yeah, I think that Essex game for me was a, was a massive highlight. And of course, um, you did blow Yorkshire away in a Sunday league game, didn't you, once when you, you just... Oh, in Edgebaston, yeah. Yeah, and Edgebaston, yep, that's correct. Yeah, I just, um, um, I couldn't believe it. I was throwing the ball after about six or seven overs and, and, and it, was just, it was just a procession. 
It really was amazing. It was a, a, a great performance on a, on, a, on a beautiful day at Eshbaston late in the afternoon and with, a, with a big crowd. I think that the pitch was, was bowling from the city and the pitch was more sort of over towards the groundsman's shed, uh, closer to that. And um, the, the crowd was just unbelievable um, on that day. Um, it, was, it was pretty loud. That must have been a big help um, for a fast bowler or for any cricketer, but uh, for a fast bowler charging in, the Bears fans, when they pump up the atmosphere, are pretty special, aren't they? That must be lovely to have that sort of backing. Well, H. Baston has that knack. I mean, um, I sat there in 2005 watching, um, I, I, um, watching the, the Ashes game, and, um, I, and we all know how tense that got. Um, and, and the crowd was just off the charts, you know, and, and, and it's so many Sunday league games and one day games that I've played at Edge Baston, the crowds have always been unbelievable, you know, so passionate, so loyal. Um, and if you, you don't need any adrenaline to, to, to just yourself to run and pump yourself up, the crowd does just gives that to you automatically. We've mentioned uh, Keith Piper's brilliance behind the stumps, AD. Uh, Chris Brind, um, thanks for the question, Chris. Uh, he, he says, when you were bowling for Warwickshire, Alan, who were the best fielders on your side? Oh, uh, the blonde bomber. Um, <laughs> uh, Trevor Penny, uh, without a shadow of a doubt. Um, um, I don't think I've ever seen him wear a cap or a hat on the field. He was so obsessed with blond blonding his hair. Uh, <laughs> Um, bless him. I think if you take John T. Rhodes and, and Trevor Penny, um, they, they weren't far from being on equal ground. Um, the very different styles where uh, John T. Rhodes was much closer and was unbelievable at anticipating and diving and stopping where Trevor Penny gave himself that extra little bit to get off the mark really quickly and, 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 uh, and, and put pressure on people. And the amount of times that people have gone just to the right of him or just to the left of him, and his quick, quick feet got him into such powerful positions to blow the stumps down. I mean, with, I mean it just helped. I mean, Osler, for me, has, has got to go down as one of the best slippers that, that Warwick has ever had. Um, and, um, and, and, of course, uh, uh, Roger Toos as well. Um, but the inner ring there for me, there was, there was, there was one, the, the, the guy that stands out there is, uh, without a shadow of a doubt, is Trevor Penny. Yes, I think I, I recall um, when the, the semi-final at Cardiff in 1995, yeah. was it? And um, David Hemp had warned Glamorgan's players, hadn't he, before the <laughs> game, not to take singles to Trevor Penny. And then David Hemp took a trip with a Trevor Penny. <laughs> <laughs> Well, they had a massive meeting the night before and they were warned. And, uh, of course, um, uh, um, yeah, Trevor, uh, Trevor ran out, uh, our good friend David Hemp, and, um, and of course, uh, and Matt Maynard as well. He ran him out as well. So, uh, yeah, what, a, what a day that was too. Question from Jonathan Collett, uh, AD. It's about the uh, Lords final against Gloucestershire in 2000, which was a bit of a rain-ruined old... Uh, game, as I recall. Um, uh, Jonathan says, we were robbed, and you got man of the match, even though being on the losing team. Uh, that was the quickest spell I've ever seen from you, and you were so fired up, I think. Um, it's two for seven from six overs, Jonathan says. Any recollections of that one? I do remember it was a quite an untidy game, wasn't it? Because it went into a second day. That's right, yeah. Um, you know, let's just say, I think uh, Gloucester were really a fine one-day side during that time. Um, I know um, Matt Windows scoring runs for fun. Um, it was um, uh, it, you know, they were they were just fantastic, and we were in a bit of trouble. We didn't st we didn't bat very well. They they did they did a good a, a very good job on us with the ball, um, and we didn't have much to defend to be honest, um, or a, a decent target to make it safe in any way, and. Uh, and then we started poorly with the ball, and, and uh, of course, Knighty threw me the the ball and uh, and and said, "Well, um, let's go and do something here." And I got, I think I've got a wicket in my third third ball of the first over, and I bowled a slow ball, the least expected slow ball, and he just ran over it and got himself bowled. And I remember turning to the, the crowd and just stuck my my hands up like that, and I just you know just trying to fire up 
the team in itself and also getting the, the, the Bears fans all G'd up. So, yeah, unfortunately, um, the rain got the better of us. And, um, you know, I remember that I've got a photo of that balcony uh, sitting next to, to, to Ashley Giles and Dougie Brown just sitting there, just moping along. And, you know, it wasn't our day. Um, so, uh, not, not, not the greatest memory, but a, a nice, you know, a nice way of trying to G up a team when, you, when the chips are down. Here's an interesting one, um, AD, from uh, Pete. Um, and uh, he says, what was your favourite end to bowl at from any cricket ground in the world and why? Uh, anywhere where the wind is behind you. <laughs> um, so um, I, never really, I never really had a favourite end. I, I was always at Edge Baston uh, from the dressing room end. I would like to start. And then sometimes the wind switched around from the city end every now and again. So I'd bowl from that end. I, I, I wasn't really, uh, you know, it, the luxury was that, yes, you get the new ball and you pick your end. So the most favorable, favorable end that the wind is slightly behind you, that was me. <laughs> so, uh, but I, I never really had a favorite end. It was yeah. just, it was just a, Oh, well, okay, let's get on with it. The wind's blowing in the right direction. Michael Ratcliffe uh, asks, AD, this is quite a big question, whether you can pick out one. What is your single most memorable Warwickshire game and why? Um, wow. Um, oh, there's got to be a, a couple. I, th I think the one that I will never forget was it was my last Sunday League game for Warwickshire East Baston and um, it was well documented that I was going back to South Africa straight after that game to go and join South Africa for a tour and uh, I was about to bowl the last ball of the game and and um, and I, I got a couple um, we won the Sunday League that that day um, that was in was that 97 um, I can't remember we played Gloucester the very last game of the of the of the uh, the season at home, and I was about to bowl the last ball, and I saw all these people around the ropes, they were all of them just ready to run on, and I was thinking, well, if I'm running now, these people are gonna, uh, it's, they're gonna go. <laughs> What's gonna happen if, it, if? So I managed to managed to bowl out. Well, I wasn't quite sure who it was, but. Uh, um, and then it was just an invasion of note and I was carried off the field. And, you know, I, I would say that that for me just showed the absolute, the, 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 the fans that I've come accustomed to, the, the, the members that were so, so brilliant in all my career, uh, supporting me and the club. Um, and um, it was a magnificent send off. I think that, yeah, that, that for me would go down as possibly the best day um, at Edge Baston. Well, you've given so many wonderful memories, AD. It's brilliant to know that your memories of the club are just as good by the sound of it. Uh, we've got one of the members, actually, as Neil Condon has got in touch just to say, I haven't got a question for AD. I just want to say thanks for being such a great Warwickshire player and for all the fantastic effort that you gave us. Um, got a question just coming um, via Zoom, uh, AD, uh, from Ellie Phillips, just asking, are you based back home in South Africa these days or still in Harborn? <laughs> uh, no, I'm um, I'm in uh, Paul in the Western Cape, um, in the Winelands area now. That, that's where I live now. Um, I've been living here for the last six six years. I moved from, we've sold our house in Harborn. Um, had some awesome memories there. Um, still miss that uh, that pub which is just about seventy five yards up the road, uh, the Bell Inn. Um, a classic little pub that we've we've always uh, vacated with a few other players um, um, that lived in that area. Um, so no home for me now is here in the uh, in 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 Paul in the Western Cape. So uh, um, where I where I've been for the last six years. And the question also just come through uh, on the Zoom chat uh, from Mark Woodward. Uh, it's a very interesting question, which will apply to a lot of people listening, I think. What advice would you give, AD, to young fast bowlers coming through at their local clubs? I get this question a lot. And um, I think mums and dads these days are, um, 
are first of all uh, obsessed with uh, technique um, and and it's a it, it creeps in a lot where the, the the kid needs to know and yes of course he needs to know the fundamentals of how his action works but a lot of the time the young kid doesn't understand that and I'm glad that when I was a youngster that not a lot of people actually stuffed around with my action because I eventually I sorted that out but I think that, and also what I was allowed to do was enjoy my cricket. And, um, I, and th that I certainly did. Um, so I would, I would just say that, you know, if your kid's got talent, don't push him too hard. Let him be himself. Let him figure it out. Um, eventually, you know, he'll, he'll have some good advice from some good coaches. But the more, the more questions and more stuff that gets thrown at a young guy these days, um, they get all muddled up, all confused, um, yeah. but never take the enjoyment factor out of it. And, and, and as I said, you know, at some point, you'll understand what you're about. Thank you very much, AD. Now, we've got a question from Brian Taylor here. We've, you've spoken about the great players who've dismissed in Test cricket, Lara and Tendulkar, but Brian asks, which opposing county batsman did you find the most difficult to dismiss? Uh... I would say um, <laughs> uh, Jack Russell. <laughs> Jack Russell, that little annoying wicketkeeper from Gloucester. Uh, <laughs> he was an absolute nightmare to bowl to because he had all these funny, not only had he all these little gimmicks going on and shuffling and just never still and the way he left the ball. And you feel, you almost feel like, how close to off stump do I need to get to knock this guy over? Because it needed to be an absolute jaffer to get rid of him. Um, and of course, we all know that test match, he, he hung around with Atherton in Johannesburg to save the test. And um, he did exactly that. Um, I just find him so tough. He was so, so tough. Um, but he was so well set up and, and, and he knew what he was doing. He, he found a way to play and uh, that was his, his stamp on the game. Um, there were some, some other players as well, but I, I just think, I, I don't think I got Jack Russell out many times anyway. Sorry, Ed, I think you had some good tussles with Kevin Curran over the years, didn't you? Yeah, that's another one. Yeah, that's a great call. Um, um, you know, he was a fighter, uh, a nuggety cricketer. Um, you know, he could bat his own way. He was never a pretty guy to watch, but he, goodness me, he enjoyed a tussle, enjoyed a fight. Um, yeah, you're dead right. Um, uh, he, was a, he was a tough customer. Uh, interesting question, AD, from Aaron Viles. Uh, who were the unsung heroes of your cricket career? Maybe thinking of family, coaches, fellow players that uh, just helped you become what you became. Well, I had a family that was fantastic. My, my dad, he played cricket himself um, when he was, um, you know, he had a horrific knee injury that um, ruined it for him. Um, I think my dad was a great supporter. I think that the, the, the family member that um, took me under his wing was my uncle, um, who was not only a headmaster at his school, but also um, a, a, a uh, a South African hockey coach and uh, was also uh, the Free State Schools under, under uh, 13, under 19 coach. So he took me under his wing. We had many backyard test matches uh, under him, um, broke a few windows at Grandy and Granddad's house um, and uh, prepared the pitches in the backyard for us. Um, but he gave me solid advice, not only as a, as a, a, a for a, a bloke and, and, and learning life lessons, but in, from a cricketing standpoint, he was a, a terrific guy. And also, there was a, a guy called Johan Falstiet. He was a big coach uh, for Hansi Cronier and, and his brother, Franz Cronier. Um, the, the, sort of in high school, really kicked on, kicked on my career. So, um, but yeah, I think my uncle was a, was a major, a major, had a major say in my, in my, in my, uh, in my, uh, career moving forward. I think we've also spoken, AD, in the past about uh, how when you first came to Warwickshire as a relatively young fella, of course, I mean, you, you've developed a lot as a person as well as a cricketer and a certain Mr. Humpage, I think, took you under his wing a little bit. Yeah. Um, he. I remember the first day I walked through the change room, could hardly speak a word of English, um, and Jeff sat 
closest to the door because back in those days you had to knock before you came in. <laughs> no second eleven cricketers are allowed in that dressing room. You're all out there in the uh, in the indoor centre. Um, but he made me feel welcome right from day one. Um, he made a point of it to pick me up and travel with him wherever we went around the country. Spoke cricket, just spoke cricket and more cricket. Um, he was a tough, tough man as well. I found out he was a copper um, back in those days. And uh, but um, look, I was I was really fortunate to have him and and and, and um, as a, as a mentor. And not only that, you know, guys like Glaston Small, um, Tim Munton, Norman Gifford, um, really, I mean, gave me solid advice um, as as we uh, as we went on. Uh, John Woodfield asked an interesting question, getting a little bit away from the Bears here, just on generally on Test cricket. He says there have been, there's been talk of reducing Test matches to four days. Um, do you think this would be a good thing against less strong opposition? Oh, um, I don't know. I don't know about the less strong opposition. I, I, I just think if they're going to do one thing, uh, you know, you can't just play four days against weaker teams and five days against the strong teams. I, I think there needs to be a, a, a level playing field. If it's four days, it's four days. Um, you know, five or five, it, it's got to be. It's got to be one or the other. So uh, I just think it's it's almost. I don't know. Um, if, is it a level of disrespect to to weaker teams? Um, you know, they want to also learn their game against the best teams in the world. Um, but, you know, I don't know where that conversation is going to end in terms of um, um, uh, the four-day test matches. Uh, is it going to go ahead or are they going to keep it at five days? I don't know. But I, I just think it needs to be one or the other. Yeah. Yes, there is quite a lot of tampering in cricket, isn't it? So sometimes just simplification is best. We've got a really interesting question from Graham just coming on the Zoom, uh, the chat um, AD. He says he faced Bob Willis at school and it was terrifying. When did you know that you could bowl fast and how did the others cope with it in your early years? Um, I think I was, I was a little bit hit and miss, uh, especially my first three years uh, at the Bears. Um, I was wild and willy and properly wild and willy. Um, and um, so I just wanted to bowl fast. And I think that the best advice I got from, from Andy Lloyd was don't worry about where it's going because you, you Put yourself, put yourself in the batsman's shoes and, and knowing that if you're going to get one right, you know, what, what's he going to tell the others in the dressing room? So, <laughs> so great advice. And, and he, was, he just let me just express myself to the best I, I could. And I think it, that nice feeling of when you know your game is at a peak, then you properly understand your action. You properly know what you can do, how you can control it. Um, and I think in, in, in 94, 5, 6, that for me was my, my I reckon, my best years. Um, and, and I had a bit more success upwards, but that's where I probably bowled my quickest was uh, during those three years um, um, where, where everything just was in sync and I sorted out my rhythm. That was a big deal for me, trying to find that perfect rhythm. Um, so, but once I got that right, um, everything else fell into place. And just uh, related to that, AD, on those um, peak years and throughout your career, actually, I mean, you're a nice chap, we all know that, but you didn't have hospitalise a few batsmen over the years in various ways. So How do you deal with that, sending all these chaps off with broken fingers and thumbs and things? <laughs> um, it's part of the job. It's, it's, you know, sometimes the pitch, the pitch, the, the pitch has got something to do with it, you know, um, and, and, you know, you get some pitches where it, it, it's just a little bit uneven and, and balls stand up and hit you on the hand. And, and unfortunately, um, you know, the batter breaks his finger or, or hand or whatever it is. Look, it's nothing that you, and I, and I say that with great respect, it's not something that you are maliciously trying to do is trying to hurt someone. It's, it's just part of your, your, your game plan. It's part of you, you testing the character of who's in front of you um, and finding out what this guy's got underneath, underneath the helmet that is, um, you know. So it's all, it's, all, it's all part of the setting up process. And, um, you know, we, we, I certainly don't like seeing 
uh, batters sprawled out and you know a, a, a massive fright for me when when I hit um, 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 I think it was Morris it was Morris um, from Glamorgan um, was it John Morris Hugh Morris, Hugh Morris. yeah a uh, Hugh Morris sorry and and it hit him on the back of the head and uh, you know we all saw what happened to Philip Hughes and it was a very similar uh, incident um, I I really you know I, stood there, I remember standing there with my, my hand over my, my mouth and thinking, oh my goodness, you know, he's stone cold out. Um, I hope he's okay. And thankfully, you know, it wasn't a, a bad one, but um, it's just, you know, fast bowling is, 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 a, is a, yeah, it can be brutal at times. Um, and it's a, it's a challenging, physically challenging, but also it can be, it can be so good when everything goes well and you, you have a significant impact on, on the outcome of the game. And to be fair to you, AD, I think it's fair to say that the injuries that happened off your bowling, they weren't you know, intimidating, short bowling. Most of it just came off a length, didn't it? Which is what fast bowlers do. But uh, just, just moving on, AD, a little bit um, related to that. Robert Wilkinson asks, um, what is the secret to becoming a brilliant fast bowler when you're not six foot three? Because, of course, height helps, doesn't it? Yeah, um, a lot of the guys, uh, the genuinely fast guys, uh, they were tall. Um, um, I think genetically, um, you, you, I was blessed with that elasticity. Um, I was flexible. Um, and I, I think the other thing is you, you realised you had a talent um, that maybe some other guys don't have. And, and you realise that you have that genuine pace and ability to bowl quick um but I, I one thing i did realize is that i didn't know how to package it i i i, I didn't know how to you know what am i going to do about this sparse rhythm or this naughty wrist um, um but um i just think that it's a, and it's also a, a huge deep desire a deep desire to compete every single day and it's a, it's it's a hunger that i can't explain to people it's a it's a I don't know. I, I think it's an inbuilt thing that makes you so desperate to, to, to succeed. And um, to whoever's in front of you, to roll over whoever's in front of you, but it is a process that you have to go through. So, um, yeah, there's, the, there's some shorter guys that, I mean, look at Darren Goff. Darren Goff wasn't that um, tall man. He, he, and, and he had this just typical Yorkshire fight in him. And he was a very skill, skillful bowler. Very, very skillful. I don't think you can teach pace. Um, you know, pace is a, is, a, is a, I think it's a given thing. It's a, um, uh, I don't know. Uh, it, it's, it's just there. And, and, and until you realize it, then, you know, you've got this. Uh, you're going to try and, and, and package this whole thing into one and, and, and deal with that. We have to wrap up soon, unfortunately, AD. It's been absolutely wonderful stuff. Neil Snowball, the Warwickshire Chief Exec, just wants to step in and say a word, uh, if that's okay, just in just a moment. But first of all, AD, just one more question, perhaps. And it's a little bit related to what you've just said about how to become such a bowler. Uh, David Harding said, did your bowling action ever need to change at any point in your career? When I first started, um, I was way too fast uh, I was way too fast in um, I was flat through the crease um, I never had any balance and I kept saying to myself you know I, I, I kept watching guys like Devin Malcolm Gladstone Small um, um, and, and guys who just made it look easy and I needed to find that easy rhythm so yes my action changed I reckon in, in 94 it, 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 I had something I had a model I had my own style, and uh, but I actually had to go and I, I worked with a, a sprint coach at um, um, at uh, Birmingham University. Bob Bulmer introduced me to this guy, and it's the best thing I ever did. And and this guy basically taught me how to run properly, and um, you know, and be effortless. You know, why do sprinters? Why are they so quick? And why how? Why do they do it so effortlessly? So I had to go and you know work with him for about three weeks. And it's the best thing I ever did. And um, that's what I coach now as well as a fast bowling coach is, is, is uh, to try and get guys to be more rhythmical. So, um, so 
and then I I got myself to launch a lot more off the floor, and 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 I, my my rhythm became very deliberate. It was slower, and uh, I could get some height. So my action changed from being flat and to much more aligned at the top uh, when I when I when I did all those other things um, to try and get it better. Well, all that work in '94 certainly worked well, didn't it? For the way you bowled in '95 AD, I think the, the batsmen of England, uh, English cricket, would have wished you'd been in lockdown that particular summer. To be honest, <laughs> AD, it's been wonderful stuff. We're already getting loads of thank yous um, for your time this morning, and I believe uh, Neil Snowball, the Bears' chief executive, would like just to come in and say a word or two as well. Sure. Yeah. Thanks very much, Brian. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, hi, AD. Great to see you. Um, thanks Hi, for, for your time and it's good to, to know that you and the family are, uh, are okay over there at these uh, very challenging times. Uh, I know from our conversations over the years just how proud you are to be a bear and it's, uh, it's great to, to hear from you today and hear your, your stories of your, your, your time at Warwickshire. Um, and I remember the, the time, well that, that Kent game that you mentioned, I know how difficult it was for you being there obviously wearing a Kent tracksuit, but being at Edgbaston, <laughs> you were truly professional as, uh, as we would expect. And, um, you know, we've had some good conversations over the years. So again, thanks very much for your, for your time and, uh, and hope you, you say, uh, stay well and, uh, and, and stay safe. So uh, thanks very much indeed. Thank you very much, Neil, for the opportunity to chat with, uh, with all of you today. Um, you know, I, I, I don't think it's any secret uh, that uh, how passionate I am about Edge Baston and, and, and what goes on there. Um, I've had some amazing memories for, for such a long time. Uh, met some great people. Um, I keep telling people that's where I grew up. <laughs> and people ask me, you know, you know where did you grow up? I say, yeah, I grew up in Birmingham. So uh, learned, learned some amazing things, uh, you know, as a, as a young kid. Um, and moving through and, and, and having the opportunity or had the opportunity to coach there with Jalo. Um, you know, so uh, I hope you guys uh, get on the park um, anytime soon. I'm not quite sure how that's yeah. going to turn out, but uh, thanks very much for the opportunity, Neil. It was awesome to chat. Uh, thanks very much, Brian, and to all the members and fans out there. No, no problem at all, Eddie. And just uh, a thanks to you, Brian, for, for hosting so professionally. Uh, and obviously a thanks to all the members for sending in their their questions and I, I know um, now that we've worked out uh, how we can do these calls we're going to do a separate members forum <coughs> uh, we'll set a date up for the next couple of weeks and we'll uh, get a date in to have a, a members forum so I look forward to that and having a bit more engagement with all the members but uh, thanks for everyone for joining today and I'll hand back to Brian. Thank you, Thank you Neil. Um, and we're already getting loads of thanks uh, from the members, AD. And thank you to all the members for joining and giving us uh, questions. It's been lovely to talk cricket, hasn't it? So it's a rotten situation that we're all in at the moment, but it's lovely to have this great game to talk about. And it's been great, AD, and really good of you to join us. It's been a joy to talk to you. And um, hopefully we'll speak again soon. Thanks, Brian. Thank you very much. Have a great day and stay safe.